needs the hops, bro. It's a nice night out, huh? Okay, I won't stand for this. That should do it. Well, at least I gave it a shot. Let me start this video by confessing that I'm not a long time fan of the series. Back in 2004 when this game was rushed to release in a dismal state, I was about 11 years old and too busy fucking around on a modded playstation 1 playing classics like Largo Winch and Mary Kate and Ashley Crash Course, so I haven't had the chance to stick my underdeveloped fangs in Bloodlines around the time of its release. Since I first played it in 2015 I've probably beat it around 5 times and I have to say that with each subsequent playthrough Bloodlines got only better and worse at the same time. For the record Vamp Part of Bloodlines is one of my favorite games of all time. However, it's no secret that Bloodlines was released in an unfinished state for reasons that have been extensively covered before, so I'm not going to waste your time by listing them here. Naturally, Bloodlines has a lot of problems, and I'm not talking only about the bugs and technical issues, which have so far been solved by the unofficial patch. I'm gonna be an asshole and leave my next level hot takes for the end of the video, so if you want to skip ahead, now's the time. Alright, let's kick this video off. Right before the game begins, you are thrown into the character creation screen. There, you get to choose between 7 different clans and a generous number of what the game calls histories. Histories basically represent what your character did before becoming a vampire and translate into boosts and debuffs to certain stats. After picking a clan, you get to play around with the character sheet. Your skill point investment isn't super important at this point because the system is flexible enough to allow you to change your preferences later. At the very least, you can dump a few points to increase seduction so you can feed on people without attracting attention and pump up melee to make early game combat easier. But again, don't bother too much with skill point allocation just yet because it won't have a huge impact on gameplay early on. Clan choice, on the other hand, will. What? Your veins flow with premier blood. <sighs> the introduction plays the same no matter what clan or gender you choose. After you are embraced during a one night stand, you are brought in front of a kangaroo court with all the vampire big shots of Los Angeles. Turns out you are not allowed to sire any new vampires without the approval of the Camarilla, the governing body of the vampires. The Camarilla enforces the Masquerade, a set of laws meant to keep the existence of supernatural beings hidden from mortals. Break the Masquerade and you get sentenced to death. The final death. Consequently, your sire is decapitated and you are spared in the last minute by the scroll click of an undead being called Sebastian Lacroix, the Ventral Prince of Los Angeles. Which is why, when I assign you a simple task, I only want to hear unbridled vehemence on your part. Whether you are spared by Lacroix out of genuine mercy or to save face following this guy's intervention is never clarified, but you're now his bitch, so it doesn't make a difference anyway. Your head is probably spinning by now from the abundance of game specific terminology. Sire, Embraced, Masquerade, Camarilla. Bloodlines is set in the World of Darkness universe, a universe where supernatural beings have coexisted with humans for millennia, and borrows a lot of stuff, including the game mechanics from it. Or something like that, I don't know. In fact, with Bloodlines, the late Troika games try to reproduce the freedom of choice, variety and player agency offered by the pen and paper game with the same name. I've never personally played the pen and paper game, but I've had exactly one drunken conversation about it in a bar so I think I'm perfectly qualified to state that Troika largely succeeded to emulate its systems. In all seriousness now, one of the lasting elements of this game's legacy is its high replayability, and it achieves this in several ways. For one, clan choice has a visible narrative and mechanical impact on the gameplay. While the main plot follows the same threads regardless of clan, Certain dialogue lines and choices, or even ways to accomplish objectives will be made available or blocked off entirely depending on the clan. Every time you play Bloodlines as a new clan, you will get a different flavor of the same game or you will reveal a whole new facet of the story and so on and so forth. In the past years, two specific clans have been praised as the poster clans of the games as replayability and depth of choice, the Malkavian and the Nosferatu. Now I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about these clans because other people have done a better job than me, but what I will say is, please excuse me. Oh, it's from Reddit, let's see. You motherfucker. 
So the thing about the Malkavian and the Nosferatu is that playing as either of these clans has a truly transformative effect on the gameplay. The Nosferatu are a hideously deformed species of vampires, whose sole presence amongst mortals is a direct violation of the masquerade. As a result, you're forced to stay off the streets and use Los Angeles' dubiously spacious and accommodating sewer system like the Doomer you are. On the Stinky and syphilis infested side, the Nosferatu are notorious spy masters and information brokers, so you get a bonus in hacking and subterfuge. Malkavians have a wave of words, by which I mean they're absolutely batshit insane. You speak in riddles and nobody understands you, except other Malkavians, sometimes. Uh, Mercurio, if that's what you mean. Oh shit, you're a Malkavian, aren't you? Damn, that's the last thing I need. I'm bleeding all over the carpet, I can't even understand what the hell you're saying. These madmen actually took the time to rewrite hundreds of dialogue choices and display them in a twisted font resembling my 8th grade social studies paper about the NWA and record god knows how many unique character reactions just for this single clan. Bloodlines is carried by some superb writing directed by Brian Mitsoda, who is also the narrative lead for the upcoming sequel. Now, in my review of Disco Elysium, I stated that and Disco Elysium has probably the best writing I've ever seen in a video game. Replaying Bloodlines helped me put things into perspective and realize how short-sighted I was. It's not that one is better than the other, rather that they're pretty much cut from the same cloth. Both Disco Elysium and Bloodlines have the same affinity for combining intricate flowery writing. It is quite peculiar, the happenings I've been made to witness for my supernatural longevity. I am thinking of one unfortunate phenomenon in particular, of unique interest to my station, both as a professional and as a sufferer. With satire. Selling remedies is honest work. I came to America after discharge from Chinese um, uh, herbal remedies forces to help aging parents with store. Definitely, I am now American citizen. And snarky oh, cynicism and absurd back. humor. Hey you! You watch your fortune red? You give me five dollar? I give you secret Chinese enlightenment. Only stupid person not want to know future. Now, I don't want to praise VTM's writing just by comparing it with another game, but because the list of excellently written games is so short, making comparisons is almost impossible. I also don't want to contribute to the popularization of yet another annoying buzzword, so I'll stop here. What VTM's writing does better than many games is fully grounding the characters into its universe. The characters make sense, you feel like they really belong in that world. It also helps that there is no filler dialogue and no endless exposition. Every single line of dialogue coming from the numerous NPCs you encounter reveals something about their personalities and backgrounds and motivations. As in real life, most NPCs won't offer you their life stories on a silver platter just because you happen to be the protagonist of the game. So it's up to you to connect the dots and figure out what their intentions and motivations are. Not that you need the writing to do the heavy lifting for you, it's quite easy to figure out Skelter's outlook on the world or that Damsel is a Rick and Morty fan. The excellent writing is complemented by the superb voice cast, which features a fair amount of talent that you might recognize from other places. Fight harder than the other son of a bitch. Every time I yank a jawbone from a skull and ram it in an eye socket, I know I'm building a better future. <laughs> I'm the finger down your spine when all the lights are out, and the name on all the men's room walls. When I pout, the whole world tries to make me smile. And everyone always wants to know who is that girl. Welcome to Fat Larry's Trucker Man. I am the proprietor and salesman of the month several years in a row. The ladies call me, oh God, but you can call me Fat Larry with a F-A-T because there's more of me to love. The cast does an excellent job of inspiring life into these characters. Standout characters of the top of my mind include Isaac Abrams, the vampire movie producer who has mentored generations of actors and directors, Beckett, the vampire archaeologist, and my favorite, Mercurio, the ex-New York wise guy turned arms dealer. It's also remarkable how much attention was put even into minor characters. A large portion of my favorite characters from Bloodlines aren't even loosely tied to the main story, nor major power players. Their existence is a natural consequence of this depressing world filled with depravity, backstabbery and intrigue. They just belong. Bloodlines reminded me of how the Coen brothers build their worlds around minor characters. These episodic characters have no direct impact or even relation to the main plot, but they are the structural pillars sustaining the world in which the story takes place. 
This world building device for the lack of a better expression is what made the creation of memorable characters like Jesus from The Big Lebowski or Larry Gopnik from A Serious Man possible. Look, I'm not an expert in cinema or really anything and I don't even know if the writers took cues from the Coen brothers but the similarities were just too jarring for me not to mention. Another thing that deserves praise are the facial animations. The quality of the facial animations makes sense considering that Bloodlines was developed on an early version of the Source Engine. Characters display the full spectrum of emotions during dialogue, which will make you think twice before insulting someone or dropping a snarky remark. The excellent writing, voice work and facial animations breathe life into the setting, which the devs nailed to perfection. Troika's version of Naughty's Los Angeles is one of dirt and gloom, where supernatural horrors lurk on every street corner, so it's not too dissimilar from his real-life counterpart in that respect. Bloodlines' is exclusive city break package features goth clubs, disgusting bathroom stalls, rundown crack houses, spooky mansions abandoned hospitals, cockroach infested motel rooms and other exotic locations that will make Sarah from HR green with envy. The hubs are pretty stellar as well. My personal favorites are Santa Monica for its anxiety inducing dark alleyways and eerie pier and Hollywood with its dimming glitz, melancholia and desperation. The rich setting and atmosphere serve as the perfect backdrop for this world filled with vampire politics and intrigue. The game implies from the very beginning that many vampires, having achieved immortality, have resorted to engaging in political long plays and intrigue out of what I assume is sheer boredom. It's kind of funny seeing these immortal beings who could do so much if they put their politics aside and work together display such petty and childish behavior and backstabbing each other for ancient grudges. Ok, I get it, the Ventru Roman secretly orchestrated the destruction of Carthage, a Bruja stronghold, but come on, that was like 2000 years ago. Go to like a blood spa or whatever and get over it. Central to the shifting political tides of bloodlines are three factions. The Camarilla, a group of elder vampires who fashion themselves as professionals and bureaucrats. The Anarchs, a loose group of rebel vampires who agree with the Camarilla's efforts to uphold the masquerade but reject the Camarilla's corruption. And the Sabbat, who just don't give a shit about any vampire laws and view humans as livestock. Vampiric society is built around a system of favors and compromises. Everybody will want something in exchange for their help, a fact which your own character remarks later in the game. <laughs> Welcome to Undeath, boss. Ain't it a hoot? Everybody has their own agenda and if you want to get the job done or obtain a vital piece of info, you'll have to compromise. Or you could just hold your ground and not cave. In my most recent playthrough, I flat out refused to kill a journalist because they just happened to accidentally witness a supernatural event, even if it meant breaking the masquerade. There are many decisions like this spread throughout Bloodlines and they make even fetch missions more interesting because they make sense in the context of the game's universe. Which brings me to my favorite part of Bloodlines, the quests. What I like most about them is not necessarily the quality of the writing or the quests themselves but the way that they glue the whole game together and their variety. The first quest is pretty straightforward, you have to go and deal with a bunch of drug dealers. From that point on the game hits the gas and doesn't stop until right before the final chapter. Whether you're intercepting an arms deal, investigating a snuff film ring, collecting bounties, helping a vampire celebrity escape hunters, tracking a serial killer, dealing with an aggressive gargoyle, you are always doing something new. Now that you've heard me drool over this game for the last 10 minutes, it's time to get to the not so great parts of Bloodlines. Let's address the big fanged elephant in the room, the combat. Personally, I don't think it's as bad as people make it to be. The melee weapons have a satisfying weighty crunch to them, especially the fire axe which has a hilarious sneak attack animation that sends enemies flying through the fucking map. Firearms are a little more problematic. Early game firearms consist of a shitty revolver that barely does any damage, an Uzi submachine gun that has the spread of a 10 meter wide avocado toast and a gimpy assault shotgun that my great grandfather used to shoot Austro-Hungarians during the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. Things get a little bit better once you gain access to more potent weapons like the Glock, a 44 Magnum, a sniper rifle and an automatic shotgun. The sound design for the weapons is pretty solid, I especially love the weighty feel of the 44 and the punch of the sniper rifle. My main issue regarding the combat is that even combined with the wide variety of vampire disciplines, it tends to get pretty repetitive especially later in the campaign in Chinatown when you'll be blasting from one fight to the next. Chinatown is also when the quality of the game suffers a sharp drop and the rushed nature of the game reveals itself fully. However, I'd argue that the game shows its first cracks way before the Chinatown hub. Most of the flaws that I'm going to mention from here on out became apparent only on my third or fourth playthrough. So they're not necessarily deal breakers or anything of the sort, but for me personally, they make Bloodlines harder and harder to revisit. Even though the people behind the unofficial patch did a stellar 
similar job of Frankenstein in Bloodlines into a functional and playable state, some flaws are too rooted into the code to ever be fixed. For instance, the physics engine is still pretty much fucked. Getting stuck indoors during fights is still as much of a workplace hazard as it was years ago and the platforming sections that the game occasionally throws into your way are a nightmare. It hurts me to say this, but the abandoned hospital, as much as I love it, is a buggy maze of barely functioning assets that the physics engine has no idea how to handle. Every fucking playthrough I try to soldier through it and then I just give up and type no clip in the console. Another problem that I have with this game is that it sometimes restricts movement for no apparent reason. For instance, early in the story you are sent by this shitstain to scout a precious object and avoid detection from the gods. As you can see, I have clear line of sight of the sarcophagus. So what are my options here? Well, I can either get off my perfectly good vantage point and risk detection like an asshole, or I can walk on these containers here on my right and get close enough to trigger the objective completed prompt. Alright, seems simple enough. Oh right, I can't. The biggest drawback of Bloodlines has to be the self-contained levels. With the exception of the Ocean House Hotel, which is a masterstroke in atmosphere and game design, nearly all self-contained levels have at least a couple of issues that can make or break your experience. I'm going to focus on two examples. The sewer level leading to the Nosferatu layer is a notorious case of bad level design. It takes between 20 to 30 minutes to beat if you know exactly where to go, but for many players it may very well represent a twisted version of the Capra Demon moment. If you were to just give up at this point, nobody would blame you. It also doesn't help that the level is a literal maze and it's infested by these Willem Dafoe looking vampire abominations. And since enemies don't grant XP or drop any loot in this game, fighting them is just a waste of time. Luckily, the unofficial patch adds a convenient shortcut about a quarter through the level that takes you straight to the Nosferatu layer. Alternatively, you can type a command in the console and eat your way through all that nonsense. It's really up to you. Another level that I dread having to go through every time I replay this game is the Malkavian Mansion. While I like the idea behind it, I'm not a huge fan of puzzles and maze-like levels in games. My main issue with this level is that the room patterns are way too samey, so it's very easy to get lost. And once you inevitably get lost, you are forced to listen to that fucking ambient track, which is cool at first, but gets so annoying after an hour of hitting it. For me, these issues make each playthrough a little bit worse than the one before and the game harder and harder to come back to. This was my fifth playthrough of Bloodlines and it's going to be a while before I revisit it. With that being said, these issues are far from being deal breakers and they should not stop you from trying out this amazing game. Bloodlines is one of those games whose drawbacks are overshadowed by the things that it does right. It's a flawed masterpiece that nails the vibe of early 2000 goth culture to perfection and manages to emulate the freedom of choice and agency of the pen and paper game. It has a great cast of characters, good story, tons of lore and an RPG system that encourages flexibility and experimentation. I'm always wondering how this game would have turned out with more care and time, but since the franchise was brought back to life by Paradox and we're getting a sequel, in the end it doesn't even matter.